Hello and welcome to the news from Bahrain International. I am Hamad Youssef. The representative of His Majesty the King for Charity Work and Youth Affairs, National Security Advisor and President of the Supreme Council for Youth and Sports, His Highness Sheikh Nasser bin Hamad Al Khalifa, delivered a speech during the graduation ceremony of Bahrain School held remotely. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Class of 2020, you guys are special. It is an honor to join you today to celebrate your accomplishment after years of hard work and studies. The end of a one journey filled with challenges and achievements and the beginning of another one. An important step and transition into the next level of your academic life. With every finish line I cross, I start another race, a race against myself. My achievement on that day helps me set the next goal and so on. Without ambition, there will be no joy. With ambitions, resistance and consistency, we realize our goals. We challenge ourselves, we excel every day, and work harder to reach an ultimate goal of serving humanity, our countries and ourselves. Today, we are going through an interesting era and transformation of how we live, study, work, interact, organizing graduations. Well, speaking of this, this virtual graduation is an alternative to a tradition to celebrate and mark our achievements. As individuals, as human beings, we are built to be resilient with our ability to adapt and our persistence to move on with life and achieve our goals. In conclusion, I truly wish each and every one of you success in whatever endeavors you choose to pursue and most importantly, enjoy your journey to be successful and achieve your goals, inshallah. Shukran. The first deputy president of the Supreme Council for Youth and Sports, president of Bahrain Olympic Committee, and president of the Estijab Coordination, Execution and Follow-up Committee, His Highness Sheikh Khaled bin Hamad Al Khalifa, chaired the committee's weekly meeting remotely. His Highness hailed the efforts of the members in following up the implementation of sports projects and coordinating with the government authorities concerned. He urged the members to continue their efforts to achieve the vision of the representative of His Majesty the King for Humanitarian Work and Youth Affairs, National Security Advisor and President of the Supreme Council of Youth and Sports, His Highness Sheikh Nasser bin Hamad Al Khalifa, of developing the youth and sports sector. His Highness also praised the cooperation of public authorities with the committee, which would further enhance Bahrain's sporting achievements on the international level. The Speaker of the Representatives Council, Fawziya Zainal, valued the directives of His Majesty King Hamad bin Isa Al Khalifa to increase the monthly allowances for the 11,000 orphans and widows. Zainal affirmed that the continued efforts of His Majesty the King is aimed at alleviating the financial burdens faced by orphans and widows. She added that humanitarian initiatives have become a feature and a civilized image of the Kingdom of Bahrain, noting that His Majesty's directives is evidence that human approach is well established in the Kingdom of Bahrain. Zainal also underlined the distinguished role played by the Royal Humanitarian Foundation, headed by the representative of His Majesty the King for Humanitarian Work and Youth Affairs, National Security Advisor and Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Royal Humanitarian Foundation, His Highness Sheikh Nasser bin Hamad Al Khalifa. The Chairman of the Shura Council, Ali Saleh, also valued the directives of His Majesty the King, considering the directives a humanitarian model. He added that His Majesty's directives to increase the monthly allowances for the 11,000 orphans and widows comes in light of the exceptional challenges and circumstances due to coronavirus and an urgent need to ensure the continuation of a decent life for them. He also noted the role of the Royal Humanitarian Foundation headed by His Highness Sheikh Nasser bin Hamad Al Khalifa in this regard. The Ministry of Health said today that the number of coronavirus cases reached 5,270, with 412 recoveries, 362 registered new cases, and two deaths. The deceased were active cases of the coronavirus, a 73-year-old female resident and a 34-year-old male expatriate who was suffering from underlying and chronic health problems. 
The Ministry of Health expresses its heartfelt condolences to the families of the deceased and urges everyone to adhere to the rules and follow instructions, such as washing hands with soap on a regular basis, along with avoiding shaking hands and close contact, in addition to covering the nose and mouth when sneezing and avoiding public places when possible. Saudi Arabia's permanent representative to the UN, Abdullah Al-Ma'allimi, asserted that the restoration of relations with Qatar is conditional upon its response to the legitimate demands of countries calling for combating terrorism, foremost among which is ending the Turkish military presence and reducing the relationship with Iran. Al-Ma'allimi added during an interview with BBC that Bahrain, KSA, UAE and Egypt are willing to welcome back friendly relations only if Qatar consents to the said demands. Meanwhile, the Saudi Ministry of Health reported that the country now has more than 100,000 coronavirus cases after an increase of 3,045 over 24 hours. This is the first time Saudi Arabia reports over 3,000 cases in one day. The Ministry of Health also reported three, 36 new deaths from the virus, bringing the death toll to 712. The kingdom also announced a further 1,026 recoveries, meaning that a total of 72,817 cases have recovered in the country. The UAE reported today 540 new coronavirus cases and one new coronavirus-related death. According to the UAE government's Twitter account, the total number of cases is now 38,808. The new death brings the death toll to 276. The 540 new cases were detected after health authorities carried out 44,000 tests over a 24-hour period. Authorities added that a total of 21,806 people had recovered from the virus. Kuwait reported 717 new, new coronavirus cases today, a sharp increase on the previous day's rise of 487 cases that brought the total number of cases in the country to 31,848. Official spokesman of the Ministry of Health, Dr. Abdullah Senad, said in a press conference that the 717 infections included 331 Kuwaitis, 888 Bangladeshis, 81 Egyptians and 79 Indians and the rest of other nationalities. Meanwhile, the country registered 923 recoveries today, bringing the total number to 20,205 recoveries. Egypt's president yesterday announced an initiative to end the civil war in neighboring Libya, a move accepted by the commander of the eastern Libyan forces that suffered he heavy defeats in recent weeks. President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi declared the initiative at the ceremony at Cairo, attended by military commander Khalifa Haftar and the speaker of Libya's House of Representatives, Aguila Saleh. Assisi said the initiative, which included a ceasefire starting tomorrow, was meant to pave the way for elections in Libya. He called for the withdrawal of all foreign fighters in Libya. And now we move for the business news with Yasmin. Thank you, Mohammed. A very good evening. You're watching the Business News on Bahrain International with me, Yasmin Ibrahim. Bahrain Old Share Index has closed at 1,269,085 points, marking a decrease of 3.49 points below the previous closing. This decrease was due to the fall in the commercial bank sector. 104 equity transactions took place, with a volume of 6,237,603, worth 6,098,497 Bahraini dinars. Investors traded mainly in the investment sector, representing 35.3% of the total value of securities traded. The lockdown and the virus restrictions in Palestine have only caused more damage to the Palestinian economy. 
Many day laborers have been laid off as businesses had to be shut down. According to the World Bank, the Palestinian economy could shrink by as much as 11% in the coming year. The Palestinian Authority is expected to face a funding gap of over $1.5 billion this year, up to $800,000 million in 2019. Employers in the United States added 2.5 million jobs in May and the unemployment rate dropped slightly to 13.3% as businesses gradually reopen across the country. The unemployment rate previously soared to 14.7% in April as COVID-19 continued to wreck the economy. The 10.3% jump from March is the highest rate and the largest over-the-month increase. The latest job report showed that the unemployment rate declined by 1.4% to 13.3% in May. May, and the number of unemployed persons fell by 2.1 million to 21 million. German Chancellor Angela Merkel said that the nation must act with courage and determination as it braces for the predicted severe recession following the coronavirus pandemic. In her weekly video address, Merkel acknowledged Germany will have to borrow money to pay for the additional spending. Germany's three governing parties announced a 130 billion euro package to revive the economy in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. OPEC and its allied nations agreed to extend a production cut of nearly 10 million barrels of oil a day through the end of July, hoping to boost energy prices hard hit by the coronavirus pandemic. Ministers of the group and outside nations like Russia met via video conference to adopt the measure aimed at cutting out the excess production depressing prices as global aviation remains largely grounded due to the pandemic. Crude oil prices have been gaining in recent days in part on hopes OPEC would continue the cut. And finally, before we conclude our business news for this evening, let's take a look at how stock markets around the world fared in daily trading. And that is it from the business desk. It's back to you, Mohammed. Thank you, Yasmin. U.S. President Donald Trump has ordered the National Guard to withdraw from Washington. President Trump says he is given the order for National Guard troops to begin withdrawing from the nation's capital, saying everything now is under perfect control. The District of Columbia government requested some guard forces last week to assist law enforcement with managing protests after the death of George Floyd. But Trump ordered thousands more troops and federal law enforcement to the city to dominate the streets after some instances of looting and violence. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser last week called on Trump to withdraw National Guard troops that some state sent to the city. Trump tweeted on Sunday that they will be going home but can quickly return if needed. Meanwhile, a Black Lives Matter protest in Hong Kong was cancelled due to coronavirus restrictions, but a group of demonstrators showed up in front of U.S. Embassy today in solidarity over the death of George Floyd. Protesters gathered in a group of eight, which is in accordance with the limit of people who are allowed to meet under current coronavirus restrictions, and took turns to give speeches outside the embassy. Well, this is actually a global issue. As much as it is an issue with the U.S., it is a global issue. People around the world will be looking at the U.S. and thinking to themselves that obviously black lives don't seem to matter that much. But we have to remind ourselves that despite all we see going on in the U.S. and in other parts of the world, black lives do indeed matter. I don't want to be here on a Sunday. It's probably one of the wettest Sundays in Hong Kong. And I'm, I'm still here because what I saw on the 25th, no, no human being should have to suffer that. Uh, he died no better than an animal in the street, like a, a knee on his neck like that. And every human being can relate and see that. I personally could not watch that full thing. Demonstrators gathered in Budapest today to express solidarity with the Black Lives Matter protests in the United States sparked by the death of George Floyd. It's an election year in America right now, which is a huge uh, thing with go what's going on with our country burning. You know, people are looting, people are standing up for what's right, and what's right is to uh, make a voice and make this be the last time that this happens to our people, people of color. It is, 
really sad what's happening in America and I'm glad that we are all taking a stand all over the world because enough is enough. And I think having these kinds of events around the world is really important to show solidarity and to show you know the, the rest of the world that the U.S. isn't perfect and to also stand with racist events in, in other countries around the world too so that we really are coming together against an issue that affects all of our societies which is racism. In news related to the novel virus, Scotland announced that no new deaths have been registered from the new pandemic for the first time since the country began lockdown measures to tackle the coronavirus. As at 9 o'clock this morning, there have been 15,621 positive cases confirmed, an increase of 18 since yesterday. A total of 1,002 patients are in hospital with COVID-19, including 646 who've been confirmed as having the virus. This represents a total reduction of 17 since the numbers reported yesterday, although the number of confirmed cases is unchanged. A total of 25 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected COVID-19, and that is an increase of five since yesterday. I'm also able to confirm today that since the 5th of March, a total of 3,801 patients who had tested positive for the virus have been able to leave hospital, and I wish all of them well. In the last 24 hours, no deaths have been registered of patients who have confirmed through a test as having COVID-19. That means that the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement remains at 2,415. However, I would offer a note of caution about reading too much into today's figure. We know that fewer deaths tend to be registered at the weekend than on other days of the week. It is still very likely that further COVID deaths will be reported in the days ahead. Museums and galleries are still closed in the UK as the virus lockdown continues, which is why art lovers in London are being encouraged to take a walk along the river to see sculptures by leading artists. More in this report. A gentle walk is one way to enjoy a sunny afternoon. But head to Greenwich and you'll get more than just fresh air. Along the river and across the water into East London lies a special route dotted with works of art. A walk along some of London's waterways that brings sculptures by leading artists to the public. The idea of the project was to connect the Olympic Park and the O2 um, with a public art walk that um, follows the waterways, broadly follows the line of the meridian and creates a space where people can enjoy public art and discover this sort of a lesser known side of London. I think particularly at the moment um, where people you know, are wanting to spend more, more time outdoors. I think through this sort of extended period of social isolation, people's daily walks, daily exercise has been more important than ever. And the idea that people could come to the line, uh, walk the line, run the line, cycle, um, and experience these works of art in the open air um, is a really positive thing at this particular moment. The artwork catches the attention of walkers, especially that museums and galleries in the UK still shut as the country battles the coronavirus pandemic. This walk is one of the ways art lovers can still get their culture fix. Well, it's interesting that the timing of it as well, because I think the sense of isolation becomes even more profound as um, uh, with the coronavirus. And, um, but I think... Uh, uh, even without all that, um, yeah, it just lends it, 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 it a, a much more kind of sense of isolation and uh, vulnerability, I think. You just walk past it, um, and you might walk past it uh, five times a week. And with over that time, you might build a relationship with, with it. You might start to think about it. You might grow to hate it. You might grow to love it. Um, it, it doesn't matter, but you, but you form a relationship with it. Um, and and that, that I really like. Many institutions have turned to the online world to engage the audience with exhibits shown on websites and video tours, and talks by art experts are ways to keep people interested. 
The 7 kilometers that takes approximately 3 hours to complete is reached by cable cars and it's a route that gives an incredible view. People are really missing the interaction, not just between themselves and the artwork, but also between themselves and other people who are going to look at the artwork. Sculpture actually works best outside. And you know, it's wonderful because if you were to go and see it on a rainy day or very early at dawn or at sunset, each of the works of art you will see look totally different. If it's glistening under um, a puddle of rain or if there's leaves scooting past it in the wind, the sculptures will look very, very different. For a public still nervous of confined spaces with their fellow humans, art in the fresh air is one way to combine exercise with culture.